Hey, this is Megan. I'm going to tell you quickly about Tetralogy of Fallot. Tetralogy means four. So this is four disorders that occur all at the same time. Um, it's, it's called a mixed defect because the patient wouldn't actually survive after birth without mixing of the blood from the pulmonary and the cardiac circulation. And so having these four disorders is what allows the baby actually to survive. So the four disorders are a VSD, and so this picture is actually fantastic because you see the normal heart on the left, and then you see all the disorders on the right. And so if you look down at the ventricles, you can see there is a hole between the two ventricles, the left ventricle and the right ventricle. So that's the VSD. And then you have pulmonary stenosis, PS, pulmonary stenosis. You also see that very clearly on the right side, the narrowing um, between in that pulmonary vein um, and oftentimes in the pulmonary uh, valve too. And then you have what's called an overriding aorta. What happens here is that the aortic valves get enlarged and they open from both ventricles instead of just from the left ventricle only. So you can see that flow if you look right in the middle of the heart on the right. Um, and then the last thing is right ventricular hypertrophy. So you can see that that right ventricle, right ventricle, the wall, is actually thickened. And so that, uh, that causes the ventricle to have a smaller amount of space for blood, blood to accumulate. So those are your four disorders that you see with this. That then causes much higher pressure in the pulmonary artery, um, and then you have mixing of the blood. And ultimately what that does is that you get deoxygenated blood and oxygenated blood together mixing, and so you end up not having as much oxygen oxygenation in the blood. So these patients, these babies are usually cyanotic. Now they're not always because it depends on how bad the pulmonary stenosis actually is. So the etiology and risk factors is really unknown, but they feel like it's a combination of genetics and then other risk factors. And so you can see the list of risk factors here. A lot is problems during the pregnancy it's itself. Um, and you also see there's a higher incidence in babies that have some genetic defects. Epidemiology, it's considered one of the most common congenital heart disorders and actually the most common for the, um, the cyanotic congenital heart disorders. And the numbers actually are kind of conflicting, but this is one, three to six infants for every 10,000 births, more common in males than females, and then often it's associated with other non-cardiac anomalies, which means if they found this, they would then look a little bit closer to see if there's other uh, abnormalities. The physical exam um, primarily is cyanosis. Now, sometimes that cyanosis is immediate at birth, and other times that it shows up a little bit older when they get what they call TET spells, and that happens during times of stress or any time of increased oxygen demands. So the most common would be crying, feeding, um, defecating, or any kind of procedure where we often see it in babies is when we go to draw blood and then we'll see them turn blue on their hands and feet and, feet and lips like you see here on this little baby. It's just a perfect picture of the TET spells. Not, not all babies have this, but that's something that that isn't completely diagnostic. Other things can cause it, but that's what you think of with Tetralogy of Fallot. Other things, the baby is going to be really small, so failure to thrive, slow growth and development, often tachypnea or dyspnea, clubbing of the fingers, usually by age three to six months, because of this chronic hypoxia, and then they get polycythemia. Usually they'll have a systolic thrill and a systolic murmur, and again, the severity of these symptoms will depend on the extent of the pulmonary stenosis. So if it's not that bad, these symptoms may be mild and uh, more difficult to catch. Diagnostic studies. Um, this can be diagnosed sometimes in pregnancy, and that would happen with an ultrasound. 
that looks abnormal of the baby's heart flow and then they can actually do a fetal echocardiogram. The other way they catch it is after the baby's actually born. So based on symptoms, they would then do an echocardiogram of the um, baby's heart and see the flow problems. Uh, a chest x-ray sometimes can call, uh, can present with a boot-shaped heart. Shoot, I wish I would have put the picture there. I'm sorry I didn't do that. I'll try to add that um, in our discussion. Um, and then MRI actually shows the flow and pressures and that kind of stuff. And then lastly, labs. Polycythemia is very common with the high hemoglobin, high hematocrit. And then I'm not entirely sure why I did, couldn't find good evidence of why, but decreased clotting factors, low platelet count, and then prolonged coagulation time. So they do have bleeding potential problems. Uh, that polycythemia causes their blood to be very thick, viscous blood, um, which can then lead to some of the complications they get, like a potential for stroke um, that can happen if this goes untreated. The top three differential diagnoses, um, this is much harder to find. That's not in most of the books, but e-medicine is a great place to find this. Um, and so the top three is other congenital heart disorders like aortic stenosis or pulmonic valvular stenosis or respiratory problems. So that could be anything, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which isn't very common in pediatrics but could happen, um, apnea, bronchiolitis or croup, pneumonia, even foreign body, um, and then a third differential would be sickle cell anemia. Last thing is the treatment, and she said to be basic, so surgery is the most common treatment. It's usually done before age six, and they actually do very well. If they have mild disease, they might not have to have surgery, but most babies need that. Uh, a couple of interesting facts is oxygen is not helpful for them. Since there is that mixing of the blood, um, it, it doesn't do that much good because you're always going to have unoxygenated blood. So oxygenating the blood more doesn't actually make their stats get much better. But the really common thing that we teach parents is the knee to chest position, as you see here in this picture. Or in older kids, you'll see them actually squat. That's actually sometimes how it's diagnosed when they have tet spells. So when they have those spells where they turn blue, you just push their knees and that forces the circulation up. Um, and increases the systemic vascular resistance and helps with the oxygenation. That's all. Hope this was helpful.